winner of 14 New York and Mid-Atlantic Emmys, including the 2009 awards for Best Interview Program and Best Discussion Series. This addict no longer has to borrow or share needles because this state's now joined the other 49 in making clean syringes available. But as we'll see on this edition of Due Process, the program is limited, underfunded, not without its critics. Major funding for due process provided by the New Jersey State Bar Foundation, committed to educating the public about the law and by the Fund for New Jersey, supporting informed citizens for an effective democracy. that may be reflected in our rate of HIV and AIDS. But the law was finally changed, and now needle exchange is a fact of urban life. I'm Raymond Brown. And I'm Fonzie Kerman in five New Jersey cities. HIV users can now get clean needles without fear of arrest and without cost. A new health and social policy that's applauded in some circles, decried in others, as the arguments weigh in, along with the images. Why do you gotta fix my car? Can't you wait till we get home like everybody else? Shut up and watch it try it. Hard drugs. Heroin. That may be the problem, but for IV users, it is not the only one. And that's not just in the news. I'll show you, Trev. <laughs> the needle brings its own set of risks and repercussions, damage, and disease. How often do you show me this? Oh, you know, that's how I got sick, girl. Sometime before Magic Johnson got sick. <laughs> okay, but lately you haven't done it. No. No, Carl, I don't sick that moment. It's not the heroin that spreads disease. It's made New Jersey a leader in HIV among drug users, their partners, even their kids. HIV, yeah. Hep C, yeah. many other things. So if we don't have it, we don't want to. Um, obtain it, and if we do have it, we don't want to keep spreading it. Exactly. You know, so try to make this self a promise today. Yeah. N no more sharing. And that's why this state finally joined the other 49 in making clean needles a legal possibility. So we don't need anything else with this? Uh, alcohol? The other 49 states have opened, have, have liberalized access to syringes, either through exchange programs like we have here or pharmacy stores. New Jersey is the last state to authorize uh, access without a prescription to these syringes. It was a step for me. So the drugs are still illegal, but now the needles are not. If you get them at sanctioned clinics in four New Jersey cities, as a start. I'm going to give you 20 needles. I told them we start you off with 20 needles. Once you're done with those 20 needles, all we ask you to do is to bring them back. We'll get rid of them for you, and we'll give you a new set of needles, okay? And you need more, we'll give you more, depending on your usage. It's a program more than 10 years coming. 10 years of fierce resistance until medical and political urging. Finally won what had been a losing battle. So I don't have to worry about getting it contaminated no more for sure. There's people out there with AIDS that have the virus, and they were more than willing to sell you a dirty needle, so, and won't lose a minute of sleep knowing that they just uh, gave you a death sentence. But so far, it is just a pilot program. I know somebody that can utilize the service. Just let them know that everything is going to be confidential. And there still are some who would like to shut it down. Let's see if we get a drug addict a needle. 
that drug addict then commits a crime. Now, do we have a civil responsibility because we enable that drug addict to get high in the commission of that crime? Worse yet, that drug addict takes the needle and ODs. Do we have a moral obligation to that we physically gave? He may have had the bullets, but we gave him the gun. Eight of these and two of them. But the naysayers notwithstanding, New Jersey's looking to places like Philadelphia, where needle exchange has been up and running for years. So much run here for the needle exchange. I mean, why do y'all run to places like this? So it's really a saving our lives. The idea is to keep addicts alive by providing clean needles. Black people only share one needle. So since I've been here, I haven't shared the needle. I haven't come here. But there's another agenda as well, to give addicts the option to kick their habit and then run. You'll get tired of the pain after a while. And trust me, it's not fun living that way at all. So Roberto Martinez made the move to rehab. Good job for the jewelry. Yes. Days that used to revolve around heroin Thank you. now start with a dose of methadone. Have a good day. You too. I didn't want to live like that anymore, so that's the reason why I'm here. And he got here through referral from the needle exchange, where syringes aren't the only thing offered. So why did you decide to use a stranger? Because I wasn't in rehab. You moved in no crime and you were here to help. Okay, employment services? Yes. Okay, is drug treatment program? Yes. Okay, drug abuse counseling? Yes. Okay. I mean, the needle exchange, it, it, it helps you. I mean, now you don't want to just send them right. to the drunk, period. Right. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so, like, that's the start. And the stepping stone right here, like, you on the way. But rehab here isn't forced, just suggested, and most clients be declined. Oh, uh, very well. Well, we still don't. We at least know that there's a place to go to where they can access treatment in one way or the other. They also get tested for HIV. If they get tested, we can treat them. There are effective drugs out there. We can't cure it, but they live longer and they live better. I would dare you to find a, a program that uh, really works to rehabilitate these drug addicts where they encourage us, uh, as public servants, to give them the needles to give them drugs, to give them all the paraphernalia that's, a, that's available just for the sake of keeping them HIV free. Do you have Seneca? No, no, you know. Give me a few more minutes. What's the message? Is the message rehabilitate yourself or here's the needle, go see that? I've had a few clients who've actually, you know, stopped, got in treatment, and they are actually, you know, clean now. And, you know, they say, you know, it's because of this program. Every few evenings, you know, I'll find a lot of help. things here, you know, I feel good because, like, I get all kind of help. Originally, I came for the needle exchange, and then I winded up going to the Next Dance program through here, and um, I'm working it one day at a time. Roberto is one of nearly 4,000 who've come through needle exchange programs in Atlantic City, Camden, Jersey City, Patterson, and Newark. One who did seek treatment and got it, free of charge because money for rehab is built into the legislation. But whether the programs are aggressive enough in getting addicts to seek more than just clean needles, Damon, that is still a matter of dispute. And one of the questions here up for debate when an advocate and an opponent face off. Stay tuned. sharing needles, I'm all for it. Anything we can do to prevent the spread of harmful diseases like AIDS and possibly I think hepatitis C maybe, um, we should be doing it. They should try to get them in a clinic where they could get drug free. Addiction is the best thing to go away. And the kind of the more we fight it, the more addiction there is. Still promoting drug use, but it's promoting at least safe drug use. <laughs> that might help negate some of the rise of um, HIV, hepatitis and other diseases. But I understand the controversy behind handing out clean needles, but um, I think the means justifies the end. But do clean needles combat disease, and does that justify needle exchange? We're likely to get a resounding no from Terrence Farley, 
former first assistant Ocean County prosecutor and former director of that county narcotic strike force. And that puts him squarely at odds with Roseanne Scotty, an attorney who runs Drug Policy Alliance New Jersey and one of the state's strongest advocates for legal exchange. Welcome to both of you. Thank you. Let me start with you, Roseanne. Some of our viewers who might not track this issue might think we've resolved all the underlying policy questions because there is this pilot program in four cities. On the other hand, it seems there's a continuing debate, as we've heard from at least one senator, about the fundamental premise that there is a value to a needle exchange in terms of reducing HIV and AIDS and other hepatitis and other disease that can be spread through the air. So I've heard about it in a Pinker study, and without getting too deep into scientific analysis, is there still a policy debate, and do you have an answer to those who cite this Don Kruger study and others that say there really isn't a health benefit to needle exchange? Absolutely. I think the, I don't think, I know that the argument in terms of a scientific debate, a medical debate on surrogate needle exchange is over. I think arguing that needle exchange isn't an effective um, public health intervention to stop HIV is like arguing that the world is flat at this point. In 2000, the Surgeon General of the United States was asked by Congress to issue a report. And in summary of the report, he said, the senior scientist and I at the department, after reviewing all of the evidence to date, unanimously concluded that there was conclusive evidence that needle exchange as part of a comprehensive HIV program can reduce HIV and it doesn't increase drug use. This is the Surgeon General of the United States and the top scientist in his department, so I don't think there's a discussion. Where should we send you home? Is the, is the debate resolved scientifically? I have two different things, two things on what Roseanne said. Uh, the fact of the matter is it just has no effect uh, on drug usage, and that's the ultimate goal here is to stop drug usage, get people rehabilitated, these programs do absolutely nothing okay. to do that. Uh, let me just interrupt you because I know you have further to go with that point. It's, is there a distinction between stopping the spread of HIV among those who use drugs and stopping drug usage? Are those two different objectives? Because it sounds as though the advocates for needle exchange have been saying there's a given amount of drug usage, we want to reduce it, but while drug users are here, let's stop the spread of disease. And is there a premise for that prong scientifically supported? Well, it's not pr it's not uh, supported because uh, all of the scientific texts tell us that the major spread of these diseases is not needles. It's risky sexual practices, clearly across the board. Some, some studies show it's like 80% of all the transmission so are essentially from needles. sexual activity. So it's essentially true that your view would be that needles don't significantly contribute to the spread of these diseases? Uh, my thought would be that they can have an effect, but so small, we ought to be worried about treat treatment and prevention and stop these people who are involved in risky sexual behavior, and then we're going to cut down dramatically on, on AIDS. And then how do you respond to the argument that there is a trade-off, that you do support in some measure drug activity by giving free needles out, and that I guess what Terry could say is that doesn't counterbalance what he says is a marginal benefit in terms of reducing the spread of uh, Well, of first of all, according to the New Jersey State Health Department, 40% of HIV cases to date in New Jersey have been caused by people sharing contaminated needles. Again, that's the Department of Public Health. Um, I don't think there is a trade-off. I think you can do both at once. I think we saw in your introduction and we've seen in stories all across New Jersey that 20, about 20% 20 of people who come through the programs at this point in New Jersey have gotten into drug treatment. We've seen people who were using drugs for 15 years or more come to this syringe get a syringe, but get into treatment. And, and, and let's look at, at the, I think we've tried to fairly depict what happens in the program. There isn't a lot of aggression attached to it. By aggression, I don't mean personal assault. But the counselors don't seem to be aggressive in their treatment. They seem to be listing that as an option, as opposed to aggressively pushing it. And would there be a policy or political impact or a detrimental impact if there were a more assertive stance taken by the exchange program in terms of trying to nudge people more forcefully in the direction of treatment? I think if we knew that nudging people more forcefully would be effective, there might be, but there isn't. What we need to talk about is not aggression, but what is effective. If you're getting 20% of the people who come through the door into treatment in the first year, I think that's a spectacular rate. I think. What you do when you are aggressive towards people is you push them away. They simply won't come to the programs. And you can't help people if you don't have contact with them. What syringe access programs do is bring people in, have contact with them, build trust, and then help them with a whole lot of 
been completing their coverage but of that. But if you saw a significant increase, let's say beyond the 20 percent that my dad is talking about, let's just say 50 or 75 percent of people coming into these programs getting into treatment, even though you might have a significant failure rate. Would that change your view about the benefits of eating this way? Absolutely. It would tell us they might work. What we know now is that they don't work. I don't know where Ray Haynes getting the 20 percent figure, but most of the studies I've seen talk about about 5 percent of the people. And you just mentioned uh, they're not very aggressive. I took down a statement from your introduction. The one I did cancers, whose, her, whose name was Dawn, her comment directly was, a few of our clients actually stop. And that's what really is happening in real life, is people are coming in, continuing, as Senator Panacchio said, their drug addiction, and all they're getting out of this is free needle. How do you address an example? Well, I haven't searched for her, but it seems to me to be what looks to be the most common answer, um, a more assertive approach would simply drive people away and it wouldn't induce more into the use. Well, the fact of the matter is if a more assertive approach is uh, not going to work, then we have to find something else. Treatment and prevention are the only things that have ever worked in, in uh, the drug field, including law enforcement. Tell, let, let, let me ask you this question. Um, given the fact that, it, that an undeniable part of this program is outreach and connection with people who are drug users, um, do you have in your mind, because you put you in the position sort of being a naysayer in this debate, right. an alternative notion of how you would maintain continued contact with that population and serve more effectively to reduce dependency on drugs and the effect on diseases? Is it an alternative that you're arguing for as opposed to using? A working program in prevention and education. Can I tell you what the outline of that would be at the moment? Maybe not. We do know that they have some luck in some of the methadone programs. We do know that there's a lot of study right now with buprenorphine, and that has some uh, spectacular-looking results to date. Um, but we know that in any uh, conversation about reducing the, the amount of drug usage, you have to stop people from doing it. But the you, you can't stop them before you stop. It. It would seem to me if they're using, let's assume they're using needles as a lure, clean needles as a lure to get people in, okay. in the hope that there's a benefit of reducing HIV. Right. That's one way to maintain a constructive relationship with the population. How would you get to the population to do the kinds of treatment you want in the absence? What's the alternative way to do it? To, to me, about 5%, which is what I'm telling you, the rate is, it doesn't matter. We'll find some, some other easier uh, and better way to get people off drugs, not to continue the drug use. Whether it's 15 or 5%, as I say, or 20%, as Ray Haynes says, you're doing nothing to get people off drugs. You're continuing their ability to do it, and you're enabling them. That's not drug treatment. That's not drug prevention. You've been conscientious years of due process. You know we've covered this story for a while. Might not have focused on the fact that there's no state funding for our program in New Jersey, unlike other large urbanized states who have California, elsewhere, that have provided public funding. What's the status of that? Is there hope, in, from your point of view, that the legislature is going to fund these programs in the next phase and fund them on an expanded basis for other state grants? We are certainly hopeful. It's certainly the best investment the state can I think it's a realistic <laughs> political proposal. We, I, yeah, I think that, you know, uh, about four years ago I was on this show and you asked me if I had a realistic political hope about needle exchange, yeah. and I said I did, and that came true. I think more and more you have the federal government on um, the edge of lifting the ban on federal funding for needle exchange. But you have People a president, and now a current president, Obama, who ran on a platform advocating needle exchange who seems to have grown lukewarm with the idea. He has not been as aggressive as we would have liked, but I think the idea is moving forward. I think it's reached a critical mass at this point, and it makes economic sense. A clean needle costs about 10 cents. Lifetime AIDS care costs about $618,000. Now, if we prevented one HIV infection, what's the we order could of pay for all these programs. Of what New Jersey might get if the Congress acts the way you hope it will and there's money for needle exchange for funding? What's the order of magnitude of that? I think we know what the order of magnitude is. Mm -hmm. I think most of these programs, I, if these programs got $100,000 a piece, it would be, all of them are running at this point on under $100,000 a piece. These are modest numbers. We are talking, spread the Let's say a yeah. million dollars for the state. A million dollars for the state be a dream. would be a dream. Right, absolutely. Now we take your million dollars and put it in front of her and say, given the objectives that we all 
surgery of your own in terms of deterrence, uh, treatment, and minimizing uh, other ancillary medical harm. What would you do with the million dollars if you had the option of taking it away from Roseanne or the program she supports and using it elsewhere to co accomplish the same objectives? Spending it on research to determine which of the prevention programs actually work. Is it going to be bupropion that we use? Is it going to be methadone continuation? But I would put the money where ultimately it's going to do the most good, and that's where it's ultimately going to do the best. Uh, or the most good is in prevention and education, not in continuing people's ability to shoot up. It sounds like your argument is that reading is shade is out ahead of the science, and that we haven't come up with the most viable scientific attack, and this one doesn't seem to have evidence that it's worked. I agree completely with that statement. Well, then what's, well, when you look at the senator from Morris County who we just saw in the package, who seems to me to, to represent at least one segment of the population that's been, it's kind of dug in against this, seeing it largely as enabling it. What's the most straightforward thing you can say without expecting them to read all the studies? And I've looked at, at piles of them um, to say it really does work. Is that what you're basically? I, I think whenever you evaluate any type of program, no matter what it would be, you're going to look at the evidence and you're going to look at the quality of the evidence. I think what Mr. Farley is asking us to believe is that on the issue of HIV prevention and IV drug use, that the American Medical Association is wrong and that he is right, that the American Public Health Association is wrong and he is right, that the National Institutes of Health Consensus Panel is wrong and he is right, that all these preeminent public health and medical organizations that we've turned to for advice on all these subjects have gotten it wrong on needle exchange, which they all support, and somehow he, not being a doctor, not being a nurse, not being an epidemiologist, has fathomed something that they couldn't, and I think that's she's ridiculous on its face. <laughs> she, her impressive lineup is the same one they use all the time, attach the messenger, because okay, I'm not a doctor. But she didn't need to be ad hominem. She's not a doctor either, but she's, uh, she's, she's lined up an right. impressive array of public medical authorities who seem to support and, it. And if you look across the board, mm -hmm. the epidemiologists say that most of the studies that have been done are complete bunk, okay? They just are not true. They've been made up, been made up fast. Uh, we look at studies from the government. Uh, we've had the, the longest running, largest needle exchange program in British Vancouver. Okay. Let, me, let me ask you another okay. question. Go ahead. Because you're a widely respected uh, figure in this thing. Um, and your voice probably counts for the legislature. Um, would you advise the legislature to just wipe out these pilot programs and not go forward with any funding or any assistance, or are you willing to have this be one of the fronts in the larger attempt to deal with the terrible uh, problem? That's hard to answer because the amount of money would be number one, because I still so any, would keep Any arguing. dollar amount, would you be willing to support the program? Uh, yeah, and it's a minor amount. I think we need to put our money, as I said, and I'll say it a, a thousand times more, We've got to stop people from doing this, and you do that through prevention and treatment. This does neither. It doesn't bring people into treatment. It doesn't do anything to prevent them from using, and it's not having any effect on how they act. Uh, we're not even stopping needle sharing. Every one of the reports tells us that needle sharing is part of uh, drug use. And even though you have new needles, people still share old ones. We're down to our last minute in your 30 seconds, having shown us to be a skilled person at prediction. Um, in five years from now, what issue would you be, be debating? Would we still be arguing about effectiveness of these programs, or would we be extending them or moving in another direction in this time? As I said, the debate on effectiveness of syringe access is over. The programs have proven to be effective. I think in five years, we will have funded programs in New Jersey, and I think there'll be broader acceptance as the programs expand and people truly understand how effective they are, both in terms of HIV prevention and also in terms of connecting people to treatment and other services. Okay. And your treatment speech, for me to let you get it in, the, the general notion just of study, of the things you've looked at as potential alternatives, which one are you going to bet on is a viable one that will be embraced in five years from now? I can't answer that question because I haven't seen the study that tells me we found that yet. That's a challenging response, which means you're going to have to come back here in five years and face the question of predictions of those five years going to be. And we'll see I what think this means in part of our background that uh, the first show we ever did together was yours. <laughs> no kidding. We'll have you come back, and I hope we beat you to the last. 
with my thanks to Roseanne Scotty and Terrence Farley. That's it for this edition of Due Process. But we'll be back here next week with more on law and justice. Till then, for Sandy King and all of us here, I'm Raymond Brown. Thanks for watching. Challenging concept, but you know, I mean, possibly if it were, you know, very carefully, you know, thought out, administered, and run. It's still uh, a killer for children. It's a big contraction of even with HIV. So anything that could possibly prevent it, or at least keep track of it, is worthwhile. Well, maybe if we take a, uh, a different avenue and a different approach to it, um, a more peaceful one, then maybe that will open up an avenue for recovery. It has to be alternative, in other words, that we need to pursue those. Major funding for due process provided by the New Jersey State Bar Foundation, committed to educating the public about the law, and by the Fund for New Jersey, supporting informed citizens for an effective democracy.